The Geordie's cockiness, his pride, his humour, the whole hot potch of ingredients which make up the man were spawned in places like this biker pub. For decades, up until the 1960s, this area of Baker was a tight, close-knit, working-class community of about 17,000 residents in 1,200 or so old back-to-back -back Victorian terraced houses. But all that was about to change when the local council decided to bulldoze the lot. Between 1969 and 1982, the council replaced those old Victorian terrace houses with about 2,000 homes, 620 of which are masonettes in what we call the Biker Wall, sometimes referred to as the Berlin Wall or the Whaling Wall. Less than 20% of that original community moved into these new homes and at the worst of it in the 90s, it had crime and antisocial behavior, which was three times the average. So in this video, I'm gonna look at this new estate, what it was like, the old biker, and ask, is this whole new project a success for the area or has it just ripped the community apart? I'm also gonna give you a couple of bits of information about the biker wall, which I think will shock you. So don't skip through the video, cause you'll miss it. It's coming up. Welcome back, it's Eddie here from Tyneside Life. If you're new to the channel, I cover the history, culture, and football of Newcastle and the surrounding Tyneside area. If that appeals to you, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the bell, so every time I release a new video, you'll receive a notification. Well, here I am in the Baker Wall Estate. Baker sits approximately a mile to a mile and a half east of the city centre, and you might have heard of Baker before. It is famous for one or two things. One thing you might not be aware of is that a couple of thousand years ago when the Romans were here, they built a wall called Hadrian's Wall. It passed through Baker and there are the remains of a Roman mile castle at Bruff Park Dog Racing Track just up the road there. It's also famous for a TV show you might have heard of or seen running from 89 to 2006 called Baker Grove. Now Baker Grove wasn't actually filmed here in Baker, it was filmed in Benwell which is in the west end of Newcastle, but it did help launch the career of a couple of local lads who went on to do quite well for themselves. You might have heard of them. Now you cannot come to this area of Newcastle, Baker specifically here, without mentioning our famous football club, Newcastle United, because this is where it all started in Baker. Rewind the clock, go back to 1892. You'll come to an important chapter in Newcastle's history, a landmark moment because in 1892 Newcastle East End who were playing here stones throw away moved to St James's Park and they did that because Newcastle West End Football Club financially collapsed and folded and vacated St James's Park it was just a playing field back then and six months later they had a meeting because there was only one main club in the city at that time and they wanted all the population to come and support one club so that a meeting decided to call themselves Newcastle United. So Newcastle East End changed their name to Newcastle United. But in terms of the historical lineage of our club, if you think of it in terms of a book, 1892, of course it's important, but you've probably landed on chapter three. If you want to go to the beginning of chapter one, you have to go back another 11 years to 1881 to a club that formed called Stanley FC. Just 200 yards down the road there. A few years later, they moved pitches just up the road there, renamed themselves to Newcastle East End, and you know the rest, because I've just told you now, Newcastle United's official club historian, Paul Juwanu, has been trying to get the truth out there for a few years now through his books and his articles about the true foundation, yeah, of the club, and I'm kind of helping the story along. I'm gonna put a link, I think, either up here or at the end of the video, I've done a complete a completely different video about the foundation of Newcastle United and why we've ended up celebrating a false foundation year. Make sure you check it out. Before we start looking at the actual new Biker Wall Estate, we need to go back in time and look at the old Biker. Two years later, in 1968, the architect Ralph Erskine designed the Biker Wall in the estate just to its south 
In the same year, a photographer from Finland moved into Biker and over the next 12 years or so, captured Biker's transition through the camera lens. She also caused a bit of a stir with the locals and in 1974, Circa Lisa Continent was interviewed by BBC Nationwide and had one or two interesting things to say about the area. What is it about the people that you find so um, attractive? Um, well, they're all very genuine, very extroverted. I like the uh, path house. I mean, it's a sort of a community centre almost. There used to be, there used to be a laundry there. Mm. Sort of, you know, as you did your washing by hand. That's changed now, but the uh, hot baths are still there. And the women have conversations over the walls, you know, it's very exciting hearing all the gossip going Is it? on while you're having your bath. Really? Oh, it's lovely, yeah. I find it very difficult to put things, visual things into words. I take pictures, I try to communicate through pictures, not through words. A vast number of the people who will live in the new biker are delighted to move into new homes. But others see what's happened here as a kind of hideous vision of what life will be like in working class districts of Britain in the future. I love living by myself, but I'm scared of dark. Are you scared <laughs> of the dark? I'm scared here. You know, I'm, I'm never scared when I'm in Baika. Why? Because I feel it's a very gentle place. You know, I know most people, at least by sight, if not otherwise. A gentle I feel place? Very, yeah, I feel very secure here. It, gentle would seem to be a strange word to use for a place like this. Well, it's strange only to, be, to people who have uh, strong prejudices about Baika. Nobody who actually lives here would say that it's anything but gentle. I think it's really sad when you look at footage like that, a whole community gone. And I don't just mean gone, demolished, gone completely. And if you look back at that clip in the Baker pub from 1974, you know, I was eight years old in 1974. Uh, I was a kid growing up in the 70s and early 80s. I can kind of relate to that sort of life. Being brought up in a, in a council estate, in a council house, I spent the first three years of my life in an old Victorian terraced property in Bensham Gated. Although I can't remember, you know, I was getting bathed in a tin bath in front of a coal fire and we had a coal shed. But I spent my whole upbringing being brought up on a council estate and there were happy times, people were happy. Council areas then were, were filled by and large with working people, ordinary people, normal people, down-to-earth people. And I take exception to this notion that there was poverty. Poverty is something different to being poor, because when you're poor and being brought up in a low salary income, for example, you don't know you're poor. You're being fed, there's electricity. There's, you know, you go outside and you play outside, you play football with the other kids or whatever. Nobody knew they were poor. We were all happy. Poverty is something a little bit more insidious. It's something different. Today, we see real poverty. People who have nothing, who can't, pay for the basic essentials. In terms of Circa, Lisa uh, Continent, that uh, Finnish girl who was 20 years old when she moved to this area in 1968 and lived in a Victorian terraced house and captured that historic period in Baker's history is just amazing. And she spent the rest of her life, she's 76 now, living in Newcastle. She went on to become an esteemed photographer, with some of her work being shown in the Tate Gallery. And she has, with um, two or three other people, the side photography centre on the Quayside, which has had to close recently, unfortunately, due to cost of living crisis and lack of critical funding. It's really sad. We're going to go now on to the Baker Wall Estate here, 
and explain about what that's all about. And like I said at the beginning, there's a couple of really interesting things, things I think are going to shock you about uh, the Baker Wall. And at the end, I want to give you my opinion on this area. The Baker Wall and the low rise dwellings to its south were designed by architect Ralph Erskine and covers around 200 acres. He was born in England but lived and worked most of his life in Sweden. You can see the Swedish influence in the design by the use of timber and brightly coloured panels. This design broke away from the brutalist architecture of the time and was in stark contrast to the flats built in the west end of Newcastle. The wall is around a mile long and was designed to shield the rest of the estate from the noise of a motorway that was never built. Instead, the A193 sits directly north of the Baker Wall. The whole project was part of Thomas Dan Smith's grandiose dreams of a Brasilia of the North, a city in the sky. Of course, we now know that Smith was later incarcerated for his involvement in the Poulsen affair. Even though the old residents of Baker were consulted about the new project and were generally supportive of it, less than 20% had moved in by 1976. In fact, Erskine is quoted as saying, the main concern will be for those who are already resident in Baker and the need to rehouse them without breaking family ties and other valued associations or patterns of life. I suspect that declining industries had forced a lot of residents to move in order to find work. Others may have been left in limbo during demolition, forcing them to relocate. Erskine's groundbreaking design of the Baker Wall Estate had drawn global attention and was seen as one of his finest projects. In 2007, English Heritage gave the Baker Wall a Grade 2 listed status, giving it the same architectural protections as the Tyne Bridge. In 2017, the estate was named the best neighbourhood in the UK and Ireland in the Academy of Urbanism Awards. So who knew? I certainly didn't. The Baker Wall is a Grade 2 listed structure. It has architectural and historical importance to Britain. Protections the same as the Tyne Bridge has protections and the estate has won a national award. Walking around this place you wouldn't think in a million years that any of those two things were true. But buildings don't make communities, people make communities. And as you walk around this estate in April 2024, it's hard to imagine that any of the folk that used to live here 50 years ago and beyond are still here because I can't imagine that for a minute. You have to be in this estate, you have to walk around it as a stranger to kind of understand how it feels. It's really run down, it's clearly socially and economically deprived. There's a hodgepodge mix of different sort of people with different accents from different parts of the world, there's different communities within communities here. In the Baker Wall Estate there's a high population of refugees who have been housed here, coming from war-torn countries, etc. There are those with high dependencies on alcohol and drugs, I've been told by one tenant. Those with mental health issues, probably a lot of folk living in this area who are probably just one step away from being homeless. You know, and I've got, I've got no doubt there are lots of decent people living around here, don't get me wrong, but there's, a, there's a, just a grim, intimidating feeling about the Baker Wall Estate. It looks run down, it looks like it hasn't been maintained very well, there's rubbish and graffiti, fly tipping. It's a neglected area with neglected people. You can also see walking around the area, it's clearly an area of high crime disorder, antisocial behaviour. Lots of people, certainly in the afternoon, hanging around. Lots of young lads, teenagers, young men as well. Hoods up, balaclavas on. Bored, nothing to do, probably getting up with lots of mischief and stuff. But then you go back to 1930, the Labour government at the time. You know, I've, it's certainly from the reading I've done now, the research I've carried out. I think I've come to an informed opinion that. Ah, you are it, mate? <laughs> you heard it here. Um, I'm of the opinion that the slum clearance schemes were very well intended. You know, nationally, you know, they wanted to put these hard work and decent people into better accommodation. But for various reasons, it just hasn't worked out like that. The decline of the industries, people losing their jobs and moving away, a decline in economy, all contributed to the system not working. And then you look at the Labour Council here, 
from the 60s with the infamous Thomas Dan Smith. And I've read up on it, you know, I'm aware of the Poulsen affair and I'm taking backhanders. And he's in incarceration. Having said that, I don't think he was an evil man. He probably had a lot of good intentions for the area with his vision of a Brasilia of the north, a, a city in the sky, to bring about a better living environment for the working people of Newcastle. But I think he probably just made, and his colleagues, some bad decisions. Probably, probably cleared some estates that didn't need clearing. Broke up communities that didn't need to be broken up. Because that's what's happened. You can't demolish your way out of poverty. And Baker, for me, you know, as, as I've travelled around Tyneside, it's certainly the most run-down estate I've been on so far. Certainly more than where I was last week and I was doing a feature on Elzig, Benwell and Scotchy, Scotswood. Yeah, a little bit sad about this area. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope you've learned a lot. I hope you found it informative. On to my next area. I'll put another little mini documentary together and uh, fascinating learning about this area. Catch you later.